This is episode number 137 of the Mixology Talk podcast, and this week I'm chatting with Julia Mimose of Oriole in Chicago and soon to open Kumiko about spirit-free cocktails, so stay tuned. Hi everyone, welcome back to Mixology Talk podcast. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of uh, interviewing somebody that um, kind of made the last Hills of Cocktail really memorable for me. Um, bartender extraordinaire, Julia Mimosa. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. And I, you know, I have a tendency to butcher last names. Did I say your last name correctly? <laughs> it's Mimosa. There you go. See? <laughs> the oh, you, track were close. you were close. I uh, appreciate it. Um, so the thing that I really remembered about The Last Tales is obviously the restructuring of Tales as a company, um, but also their kind of reach into helping other bartenders and putting a focus on that, um, and also the spirit-free um, aspect of it. And you were a, a significant portion of that um, throughout Tales. Uh, would you mind kind of talking about uh, some of the events that you were uh, responsible for at, at Tales this last year? Sure. So I uh, helped out with the William Grant and Sons portfolio party, and mm -hmm. I got a call from Charlotte Boise a few months prior, um, where she ha was sharing this radical <laughs> idea of having a portfolio party for all of their brands, but without any alcohol. So a completely dry portfolio party at one of the larger spirits conferences in mm -hmm. the U.S. And for me, having been kind of on this journey of spirit free and getting the word out and talking about these really thoughtful, complex drinks that don't have alcohol in them. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really exciting to hear that this big company would even consider doing something like that. And in a way it was really kind of thought provoking as to, well, how can we take the kind of the story behind each of these spirits and present them in a spirit free manner uh, and really kind of keep the party going and having fun. So it was a really exciting moment and fun challenge getting with the ambassadors and talking about their brands and then creating drinks around those stories and flavor profiles. Yeah, and I went to that, uh, the, that William Grant, uh, I think it was like their opening party, right, for mm -hmm. Tales? Yeah. And uh, how many cocktails did you end up developing for that one, one party? Uh, I think it was 12. Oh, wow. Or so, somewhere, somewhere in that vein. I can't remember the exact number now. There was a lot. I, I, tried, to of, yeah. I tried to have as many as possible. We had a, kind of a small crew with us. So yeah. we're all sampling them and uh, tasting them all, and they were all fantastic. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> no, absolutely. Thank you. And, um, and it must have been a real challenge to kind of come up with all these drinks, and um, especially trying to highlight um, spirits that don't, aren't present in the cocktail. So I uh, definitely appreciate it. And just kind of a... a on my end, um, the next morning was a lot more pleasurable. <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> Didn't wake up. And this is kind of like a, a lot of the consensus that we had is um, I talked to a couple of the bartenders and were like, you know, I'm not hungover. I'm not, you know, foggy. I can enjoy my day. Mm -hmm. um, so you worked your magic. So definitely. <laughs> <laughs> That's great to hear. Um, and then you also had um, uh, a seminar as well, right? Yes, I was on a panel talking about uh, these non-alcoholic drinks but with a focus on the distilled non-alcoholic spirits, as some people are calling them, but non-alcoholic mm -hmm. ingredients that are currently being made and you know whether it's a, a fad that'll go away or if it's something that is here to stay. Sure. And um, what was um, kind of the consensus of after the seminar? Is this... Uh, kind of a fad or do you think this has kind of got a permanent um, uh, presence in the bar programs from here on out? I believe that this category is here to stay. I think it's a category that wasn't really explored until now. And so in a way, I think we had this great opportunity to just create and make things that haven't been had before or done before in the realm of non-alcoholic. Up until now, they've been called mocktails and right. they are kind of centered around very sweet syrupy concoctions mm -hmm. um like the shirley temple and kind of created more so for children than for discerning adults who are out for an evening with their sure. friends and so yeah i don't like to think of it as a trend 
I guess we can say that it is trending. People are talking about it. And so it's getting a lot of attention from larger brands such as Wim Grants and like even alcohol companies are paying attention now. But mm-hmm. I think it's something that the guest has been wanting for a long time. And we are just now at that point where we can provide it in a thoughtful way. Absolutely. And I remember um, from my experience behind the bar, it was more of an afterthought, um, kind of like a, oh, crap, I have to make a um, mocktail or, you know, spirit-free cocktail on the fly. Mm-hmm. What do I have? I have lemon, lime, orange juice. I have pineapple juice. I have right. ginger beer. Okay, that's a great modifier because it will stretch yeah. out the cocktail. Um, and what kind of syrups do I have on hand? And there's always kind of like this scurry to kind of give a really cool guest experience, um, you know, in a bar setting but pretty limited on resources. So um, right. just hearing that different viewpoint has been very refreshing and um, you know, no pun intended, um, but uh, it's just kind of a, another aspect of customer service I, I don't think we really have embraced yet. Um, so sure. I think it's a, a fantastic idea and I, I'm, I'm a big fan. Um, so what got you into bartending like in the beginning? Like how did you start down this whole path? <laughs> So I was born and raised in Japan, Mm -hmm. and right before I moved to America to attend university, Mm -hmm. and when I, right before I left Japan, I was working a number of part-time jobs, and so I was able to watch bartenders there and was completely enamored with what they were doing, and I was really only allowed to polish glassware (laughs) and pour beer and wine but um just seeing the way in which they created these just elegant experiences for for their guests was really it had a big impact on me and so knowing that I was going to be going to America I was like I want to you know find a job bartending and learn to bartend and use that money to help pay for school that was kind of the idea was I was always going to be working no matter what and so I thought I want to be a bartender and then when I moved to America though It was a challenge actually getting hired on uh, at a bar. They were very hesitant to hire a girl in that area. That was a big thing. And so I started off as a cocktail waitress, host, uh, server, bar back. And bar back was a really, it was the best way, like to get my foot in the door really, because then I was able to observe and learn and finally started bartending. And then I totally fell in love with it. Sure. And how long ago was that, um, that you fell in love with bartending and started actively working behind the bar? Oh, it's over 10 years ago, 11, okay. 10, 11 years ago. Yeah. 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 And uh, I agree with you. Bar backing is such a great way to kind of get in there and kind of um, earn your, uh, earn your knowledge and, you know, kind of yeah. get an understanding of being behind the bar. Um, so that's really cool. So, and then how did you start to pivot and kind of think about um, like the spirit free? When did that kind of start to come into play for you? My parents don't drink any alcohol at all. Uh, and around the time when I realized that I wanted to pursue bartending, the hospitality industry as a career, I realized that I do want my parents to be able to come into wherever, what, my place of work and have a really great experience. Mm-hmm. And so I started at that time while creating cocktails, also thinking about ways in which I could make versions of those that didn't have any alcohol in them or just standalone non-alcoholic options sure. just in case they ever visited. So that's funny. That's kind of how it started. And uh, yeah, it worked out well. They still, the timing still hasn't matched. My parents live in Japan. And so when they, every time they visited, I've either been uh, in the process of opening a bar, starting a program or yeah. Pretty much every time. I just haven't been behind the bar when yeah. they were in town. So hopefully that will change with with the opening of my bar this yeah. fall. <laughs> yeah. And so do when you go back and see your parents or when they come and see you, do you make um, drinks for them and kind of show them kind of your skill set and like, this is what I do for a living? And Yeah. Uh, that's pretty cool. It, it's fun because um, my whole family, for the most part, doesn't drink. And so whenever there are those family reunions, they'll have me make fun drinks for everyone to, uh, to enjoy. And uh, they, they are all very curious about what I do. It's a world that they don't really see much of. And so they had me do a, a class for them. 
<laughs> and it was with, like the little cousin, so all these little kids, and I was showing them, you know, manicuring garnishes and, you know, putting herbs on the side of the glass and how to highlight, you know, all these expressions of flavor that are in the liquid, but aromatically. Mm-hmm. And it was really fun. It's kind of like an arts and crafts project. That's hilarious. That's amazing. Liquid. <laughs> You're inspiring another generation already. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, um, one of the other things I was going to ask you was, um, since this is so kind of different and, you know, when we, we talk about creating cocktails, um, spirits are such a significant portion of the overall volume. How are you kind of adapting flavors um, to make more of a spirit-free cocktail? Um, you know, what, what's kind of the angle that you're going with when, uh, when you're conceptualizing and, and thinking about um, creating this, this, this cocktail? That's a great question. There are, I think there are two ways to approach spirit freeze. And the mm-hmm. one is from a cocktail mindset, the classic cocktails and thinking about um, those equations, if you will, or templates that we use as bartenders in creating. So in a lot fashion, for example, which is the definition of a cocktail spirit, bitter sugar, water. In the spirit-free realm, when you take spirit out of the equation, you have bitter sugar and water. Mm -hmm. But realistically, let's say we take bitters out as well because there's alcohol and bitter, so then it's just sugar water. Right. And that doesn't work from a development standpoint. Like if you're trying too hard to recreate cocktails into spirit-free form, Mm -hmm. With a sour, you have spirit, citrus, acidic component, and sugar. And so if you take that away, then it's basically a lemonade or a limeade or whatever. And, you know, that's nothing too interesting or complex. And so I started moving away from the cocktail templates and then into flavor descriptors as a way of developing spirit freeze. And so uh, thinking about an old fashioned and how it functions as a cocktail, it's something bold, it's something that is really enjoyable over time as it sits on ice, Mm -hmm. basically something that could use a little bit of dilution. And the first sip is going to be extra intense and the last sip is going to be a little bit softer and more nuanced, but kind of refreshing in a way that makes you want a second one. And so how do I create a non-alcoholic version of that? And it basically comes down to creating, I call them bases, but Mm -hmm. basically you think of um, steeping spices and herbs and, and teas, pretty much any component into a water base and then using that as that backbone mm-hmm. for the spirit free. A challenge that comes up with spirit freeze when thinking about them in the, in the construct of a cocktail is that this, we don't have the spirit, so you don't have that backbone that benefits from water. Sure. So thinking about like a lovely whiskey, sure, it's delicious, like meat or on the rocks, but in a, in a highball form and cut with water, it opens up the whiskey and starts to taste completely different things. Whereas if you have a really lovely spirit-free base that's balanced and enjoyable and then put that on ice, it'll water down so quickly and lose a lot of its itself. And so water in a way is kind of the enemy. And so the goal is to get as much flavor into those water components as possible so that the drink doesn't water down and over dilute over time. Sure. So with the ice, are you doing um, a lot of your own like manufacturing? You're, you're doing flavored ice, you're doing, um, you know, e- extracts and stuff like that. So that way when it does finally dilute, instead of taking away from the cocktail, you're actually kind of adding more ingredients into it and making it a different experience. Yeah. So I'll do flavored ice. I will do ice or the base frozen. So it's basically the drink served over ice that is itself. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. So it's very consistent. Also practicing a lot of um, just pouring chilled, ready to drink spirit freeze into chilled glasses. So okay. serving down or up, avoiding the ice when possible, when they are a little bit more of a nuanced or delicate style of spirit free. I do a lot of pairings. Mm-hmm. Um, specifically at a restaurant called Oriole in Chicago. And it's a 15 or so course tasty menu. And so I work with, with chef and with the sommelier and kind of talk things out and work out spirit free pairings for these, um, for these courses. And I found that 
when eating, it's often better to avoid having things on ice that are like ice, ice cold because of the temperature and the way that it, in a way, almost numbs your palate. And so keeping things in the same realm of wine temperatures. Sure. So ambient to slightly chilled. And that works out really beautifully for spirit freeze, I found. And so kind of exploring the room temperature spirit free. <laughs> yeah, and I find that yeah. uh, uh, one of the things that I've always kind of wondered and experienced you know, wanted to experiment with is the idea of um, aromatics that kind of open up even when they're cold. Um, I haven't found any good resources for that um, just because the, the the fact that they're cold kind of condenses, you know, and kind of um, minimizes their aromatic qualities. Um, but experimenting with temperature and serving temperature um, is something I haven't really considered. So that's a really great idea. Um, you know, it's the same point that beer and wine are kind of served at very specific temperatures if you want to right. truly experience them. Um, that's a really cool uh, thought process to go through is, you know, if I'm going to be serving this drink, is there an optimal temperature to be serving it at? And there probably is. So that's, that's really cool. Um, one of the things that you mentioned earlier that I kind of want to just kind of get a better understanding of, um, mm -hmm. if you don't mind, of course, is um, you mentioned bases, um, mm -hmm. that instead of spirits, that you start to move towards building bases. Can you talk a little bit about some of the um, bases that you build, just so we kind of have a better understanding of kind of um, what you mean by that? Sure. So I don't, I try not to define spirit freeze by the cocktail they are not. Mm -hmm. So saying that, you know, this is an old fashioned, but not an old fashioned, or this is not a Negroni or uh, not a gin and tonic, not a martini, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. But I do like to use flavor profiles of spirits and bitter liqueurs as inspiration for bases. So sure. a good example perhaps would be my bitter red base. I'm not very creative with names. But the bitter red base is essentially looking at these wonderful Italian bitter red liqueurs that are out there, aperitivo style drinks and all of the ingredients that go into them. And it's kind of wonderful because with these, there's so many resources for seeing what people are using as bittering agents or, you know, bitter orange, bitter lemon peel. Uh, when it comes to vermouths and stuff, looking at all of the botanicals that go into those and basically taking those ingredients and steeping them in water. Mm -hmm. For the bitter red base, I've experimented with a number of different types of peppercorns. Um, peppercorns are fantastic for giving a little bit of a tingle. Mm -hmm. And in the case of Sichuan peppercorns or Sancho, which is a little bit more green and floral and citrusy and bright, they have a little bit of a numbing quality to them. And so in a way, it's reminiscent of the little bite that you get from, from alcohol, from mm -hmm. spirits. And for bitters playing around with orris root or angelica, gentian, uh, for color, there are different types of um, de like dehydrated berries or uh, pepperberries, peppercorns, like Tasmanian peppercorns from uh, Australia have this fantastic almost magenta hue, which uh, plays very, very beautifully into the bitter red. And hibiscus provides fantastic tannin and acidity as well as that gorgeous pink reddish hue. And so when mixed with um, certain types of sweeteners, so it could be like agave nectar or honey or uh, brown sugar, and then with brown sugar, you have like light and medium and dark brown sugar. They all provide little accents and hues and colors. And so in a way, it's kind of playing with all of these color palettes and, and spices and botanicals and flavors to reach a base that is very similar in appearance and flavor to the inspiration original. Got it. No. Bitter red Italian. <laughs> yeah, no, that makes a ton of sense. You know, you're just kind of layering flavors in there, kind of uh, building it as you go um, and hopefully getting it reminiscent, kind of like just that mental snap of like, okay, no, I get, I get where this is going. That's really cool. Right. Um, and then um, when you're doing this and um, is there any new techniques that you've had to develop along the way? Um, because I mean, the techniques for cocktail development um, is pretty straightforward. Um, you learn a handful of things and you can go a long way. Is there anything you've had to like tweak and like, okay, that won't work. I have to do something new and this is what you came up with? For the basis, um, 
kind of playing off of, you know, those Instagram videos and stuff where people are cooking in one pot or whatever. And they're just like, you put things in and then take things out and put things back in again. Mm -hmm. In a way, it's kind of similar to that where look, looking back to um, water and how that plays a role in providing a, basically it's like the vessel in which all the flavors go into, but too much water in it takes away those flavors. Sure. So when getting all of these layers and trying really hard to keep it all in the same pot, but then explore bringing it to different temperatures in the pot for the infusion of different elements and incorporating mm. all of those in different times. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. So basically, um, when you're like extracting rosemary, for example, um, it has a band where it's the perfect extraction. So if you go too heavy, it's going to be super tannicky and bitter and you're going to lose a lot of the aromatic qualities versus, you know, something too low and it's not going to extract at all. You're going to get these really high, like really light kind of um, aromatic notes that don't really persist throughout the cocktail. So it sounds like if I understand correctly, you're trying to find that happy um, boiling point or extraction point for every single ingredient that you're working with. Is that yeah. correct? Okay. Kind of. So the recipes that I write, um, have a very different flow to them. So rather than all of the ingredients are at the top and then it's like, you know, uh, grind and then toast all ingredients and add water and let steep for 30 minutes and then strain. Instead, it's more along the lines of five component, five ingredients are going to be toasted and then um, add water, bring up to a boil, let simmer for 20 minutes, bring temperature down to about uh, 80 degrees Celsius and then add xyz ingredients and let steep you know at that temperature then bring up to a simmer and add you know these two ingredients and so it's this weird like long flow and it's kind of like a witch's cauldron pot i think kind of just like adding things in but the different timings allowing things that need more time to steep steeping in that uh, that base and continually adding flavor to the base rather than doing separate uh, infusions into water basically and mixing them all together because then that's just that's a lot of water. Right. Absolutely. And so you probably wash out a lot down. of the flavor yeah. um, at the end too. Um, so that makes it, that's absolutely fascinating. So how long does it take you to make one, one base usually? Development takes a long time. <laughs> It does. <laughs> it sounds like it. So the total cocktail <laughs> that you made for William Grant said had you busy for a while then, huh? It was an, in, it was an intense couple weeks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. And just thinking about um, there is an incredible team helping to prep everything for the event itself. But I was just thinking about what a large format these were then going to be created on. So it was, it was pretty intense. But yeah. once... Um, after a little while, I've, I've kind of gotten the hang of it. So in a way, I have templates that I follow, and I've gotten to know these ingredients and how they work. And uh, one ingredient that I adore and I'm continually learning more and more about is tea. Uh, for me specifically, I mean, Japanese teas have a very special place in my heart, but I adore the fact that with some of these higher-end gyokuros, um, green tea, mm -hmm. that you can steep it five or six times, but steeping at a very low temperature to start for a very short period of time and then gradually increasing the temperature ever so slightly and the steep time ever so slightly so that you're not pulling too much tannin, but rather getting different styles of umami that come through and different flavors of green. It's just a really, really unique tea to play with. And so That's getting cool. to know, yeah, getting to know the stages of gyokuro and the flavor profiles that come out from these different steeps allows for play with these bases where I think, okay, I want a second steep gyokuro for this or a third steep or a first steep or a blend of the, the first and the third. Mm -hmm. And then I just drink the second or kind of, you know, play around <laughs> like that way. But how one ingredient can provide so much flavor in so many different ways. And I guess in that way, kind of making the most of these resources, you know, not just one and done. Mm -hmm. And then it's, you know, used up, or rather it can be used in many different bases or even uh, enjoyed on its own or made into a syrup. There's so many different ways to use one ingredient. That's kind of a, a goal that I have for the spirit phase that there's as little waste as possible, but also maximizing the uses of these ingredients that have so much flavor locked in. 
Yeah, no, that's amazing. I haven't um, heard about the tea, but that's something I've um, started to look at. I'm actually trying to find somebody that's an expert in tea um, to talk about it. Um, so if you know anybody, I, I would oh, I know some people. Yeah, I would love an introduction. Yeah, I think, absolutely. Uh, um, I don't, I don't know enough about it, and I think it's one of those. Um, it's just another um, cabinet to pull from for flavors and you know tannins and um, hearing your passion for this one particular tea is like you know you can go down an entire rabbit hole for your entire career probably in tea oh, yes. and still know nothing <laughs> so <laughs> that's how it feels <laughs> yeah and it's incredible I, I i drink a little bit of tea but nowhere as much as i should <laughs> <laughs> we can change uh, that <laughs> yeah no i'm excited about that too um it's been a it's been a fun fun exploration i um a couple of years ago i tried uh royal bus chai yeah that was my first um kind of experience with it and it just blew me away and yeah. just how profound it is in cocktails and um and how versatile it is was just it was it really kind of changed a lot of the way because I, I in the past i think it was just more along the lines of like you go to a japanese restaurant or a chinese restaurant they give you green tea and that's your mm -hmm. whole tea knowledge um and just seeing the all the different ex expressions of tea and what's out there is been a lot of fun um so sure. yeah if you have somebody um that knows a lot about this i would love to kind of go down the rabbit hole with them. yeah absolutely i will connect you oh perfect thank you um so where do you draw a lot of your inspiration for these drinks from because they're kind of like very um new like i've when i tasted them at uh, the william grant party um, a lot of them were kind of like familiar. I was like, oh, I can pick out certain things. But mm -hmm. for the most part, they were just kind of completely different and very, very, very tasty. Um, so how do you come about like just drafting an idea for these? Where do you get your inspiration from? It comes, inspiration comes from I mean, truly all over the place. But I would say if I were to kind of strip away all of the the poetic stories about the sun, the sunsets that I've seen, or like in this mountain top that I was on tasting this tea that brought, you know created these ideas. It really comes down to the people. Mm -hmm. And so, so for example, for the William Grantson's party, the inspiration was definitely the spirit. Mm -hmm. But then it was also conversations that I got to have with the ambassadors about this product that they represent and how they see it being perceived or their favorite cocktails with it mm -hmm. and then that led to a lot of these drinks um the hendrix bar was really fun because it was a a play off of tgif yeah. was, uh, i remember that one yeah that was yeah, i think that is hendrix uh -huh. and so we wanted to have some fun with the drinks and kind of go back to almost the the super super classics but uh like a long island iced tea you know how do we take the concept of a long island iced tea which is everything <laughs> yeah. from the well you know going into the glass but that the idea of a four bottle pour and then topping off with sour mix and then topping off with cola how to take that action and turn it into spirit free form while paying an homage to Hendrix, but also I wanted to have a little homage to New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And so I started off with a base that was comprised of some select Hendrix botanicals, um, but with a focus on the juniper, coriander, and caraway, and then playing up some curry notes, actually bringing in a Japanese curry powder. And with fresh, fresh lemonade. Mm -hmm bringing all of those together as a base. And so we were going to have them in like four bottles in their well, so they could just pull that base. And it's all the same thing. Nice. And the bottles are like do the pour and then fill a glass with ice and then top it off with a splash of a bitter lemon soda from mm -hmm. Top Note Tonics. And then a little, the layer on top was to be a chicory cold brew coffee. Oh, cool. And so kind of bringing a little bit of the New Orleans coffee into play, but essentially it's a, gin botanical curry spice long island in a way so it looks like a long island but it's not at all so mm -hmm. that's kind of part of the fun is um the process of the drink inspiring what it looks like but it's once you taste it it's completely different sure so that's that's one approach the um did do a a negroni-esque 
uh, during the, the conversation there too was to be able to do three equal part po- equal parts pours mm-hmm. because again the thought was there they were going to be free through three point behind that bar and so developing a bitter red base and then a vermouth-esque base and then um some sugar some mm-hmm. simple basically and then bringing all those together in a glass other inspiration it comes from the idea of you know if i am just walking into a bar and the sun's still out you know but i'm not drinking alcohol what would i want to have mm-hmm. or if i am coming in at the end of a long night and have been, you know, enjoying some drinks, but really just want to kind of settle in with something like dark and bitter and brooding, but that doesn't have alcohol in it, you know, what would that be? And so these kind of stories of a time and a place and a person living their life Mm -hmm. inspire a lot of drinks. So it's almost a feeling to be in when having it. That's really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, Yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty cool. Um, so when you um, roll this out to Oriole, was the first place that kind of really got the, um, um, the ball rolling for you with spirit-free drinks, or was it another place uh, before that? I had started, they weren't always menued, but I had started off, I used to be in Baltimore for like a year and a half or so. Mm-hmm. And I was working at a cocktail bar there who, and then the owner opened a second little bar. So I made the program there and I had two kind of agua fresca-esque, esque non-alcoholic options um, because it's kind of like a Mexican inspired spot. And at the time it was important, that was really important to me then because there was a chance that my parents might come to Baltimore and I wasn't sure. So I wanted to be ready in case, but we also had a lot of families coming in earlier in the day um, for the food. Mm Because it was a little bit of a restaurant bar. And uh, yeah, so kind of ever since then, really, I've always tried to have something on the menu. Um, When I was at the Aviary in Chicago, I developed the non-alcoholic drinks. And they were essentially non-alcoholic versions of the cocktails. And so they looked the exact same, Mm -hmm. but with... uh, obviously very different ingredients in the base of it. And then when I left Aviary and opened up Green River, it was really important because it was a very much a restaurant bar. It was really important that we had non-alcoholic options. And with the first menu, we didn't have them printed on the menu, um, but we were getting so many orders throughout the course of an evening that we put together, it was kind of an outline of suggested non-alcoholic drinks that we were able to make with some mm-hmm. of, you know, we had lots of house made syrups and, and all of the different juices and stuff. So we were able to do quite a bit, but putting together a kind of menu that the servers and the bartenders knew so they could help guide a guest through all of the possible options. Cause it's hard when they're not printed. Sure. And then for the second menu, made sure to include a non-alcoholic drink for every section of the menu. So there are eight sections in the menu inspired by a raw material that basically what gets distilled to become a spirit. So it's like rye, corn, barley, uh, wheat and oats, sugar cane, molasses, agave, fruit, grapes and apples. And so each spirit free heavily featured one of those components. So that was really fun. And the reaction to it was really, really great. I think people were really happy when they saw that there was something for them on the menu. Yeah, and um, as a side note, Julie, my wife, and I um, went to Aviary, and uh, she was pregnant at the time, um, and she had the uh, the non-alcoholic, and I had the you know the the for the spirit free, and I had the spirit cocktails, um, and there were many times that I preferred hers over mine. Oh, really? Yeah, wow! It was really uh, cool to see them kind of side by side, um, and uh, get to experience both sides of the menu, um, because I mean, Aviary, you guys for actually. Sure or still execute very, very well. I mean, top tier. So um, just being able to see that the spirit-free focus on it executed so, so well um, was really, really uh, probably one of the more formative uh, memories I have of that, uh, of that whole night. Um, so thank you. <laughs> when, uh, when did you go? Must've been about three years ago. Okay. I want to say. Um, so, cool. yeah, in 2015, 2016, maybe. 
Um, so uh, yeah, it was it was great um, nice. to see, and I, I can't remember off the top of my head, but um, there was definitely a Negroni esque uh, cocktail that really blew me away, and um, mm -hmm. it looked and looked like it, and it had such great uh, background flavors um, that I couldn't believe it was spirit free. And I was like, wow, this is delicious. That's awesome. So have you ever had any challenges um, explaining this to a guest, um, <laughs> the whole concept? Because uh, I remember in your seminar uh, that you mentioned that the, um, the cocktails or the spirit-free drinks that you make at Oriole are equally as priced uh, as some of the cocktails on the menu as well, or pretty close to the same price point. Um, have you had any like hard times trying to explain the value of this to a guest or what this kind of represents um on the menu or anything like that i haven't had any difficulty explaining it to guests who are actively searching for spirit-free mm -hmm. options most of the conversations um take place with guests who are enjoying their alcohol mm -hmm. and are questioning why anyone would ever want to have something that didn't have alcohol in it <laughs> And they definitely use price as a, as a topic sure. uh, of conversation and kind of a point of discord. They, they almost in a way perceive the value of a drink is the proof in a way for some people. And it's interesting that the people who aren't going to order it anyway get so up in arms about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I try to kind of share with them a little bit, a condensed version of that process I was telling you about, that crazy pot where everything goes into, but then also focus a little bit more on the ingredients that we're using and the story of the teas, um, mm -hmm. you know, that it's a, it's a first flush, you know, green tea coming from Uji and talking a little bit about the history of it and how that in a way can correspond to some of the rich histories of the spirit that they're enjoying and that, and you know, crafts, craftsmen and women, the tea growers and the, the whiskey producers, you know, how they're similar but different. You know, it's sure it's a really delicious product that we get to enjoy and there is a price attached to it that's that's fair for the amount of work that goes into it and the quality of the product. And we want to serve our guests, whether they're drinking alcohol or not, the best possible quality product that we possibly can. So yeah, kind of just bring it back to that. <laughs> yeah, and I feel like this is such an important part of kind of what we do is um, being able to tell the stories um, mm -hmm. that are important either to the drink, to the environment, to the ingredients that we're using. Um, and, uh, you know, I really like the approach of saying, no, there's, there's actual a lot of value in what you're getting. This is why, um, you know, the, the farmers, the tea farmers, and the care that's given to all the ingredients make this as good as it is. So... Um, that's really cool. Um, now, are there uh, any kind of resources that you would recommend? Like, let's say a, a bartender or an enthusiast is listening to this podcast. They're like, oh my God, I, I want to I do this in my bar. I want to get started. I want to start to develop my skill set behind um, crafting spirit-free drinks. Um, is there any good resources out there that you would recommend somebody taking a look at um, and, uh, you know, kind of getting a better understanding of this? Now, I know that there are some people like working on on books and stuff now to kind of cover the category, which is really exciting. I would say that if the the hope is to develop complex drinks for for a bar and for service, I think taking a look at um, cookbooks. Mm -hmm. is a really fun place to start cookbooks and uh, pastry as well. Um, getting to know ingredients that they're putting together and then seeing if you can take those ingredients and get them into liquid form. Sure. Uh, savory and bitter are some, some flavors that are a little bit harder. I find to get in spirit free form, they take a little work, a bit of work on the front end to create bases Mm -hmm. It's very easy to go out and buy amazing vinegars, which I highly recommend, uh, drinking vinegars, but also um, all of the different juices we have and all of the amazing fruits that can be very easily made into syrups and stuff like that. Those are all flavor profiles that are fairly straightforward and easy to, to take from cocktail form to spirit-free form. 
but the ones that are a little bit more complex are the bitter and the savory, and those are flavor profiles that people actively seek when they're going out because they take a little bit more time. And so I would say getting to know, uh, kind of looking up, not recipes, but those ingredient um, information sheets on vermouth and bitter Italian spirits and bitter, like Amers, like bitter French uh, spirits and any kind of obscure, oh, like aquavits and even gins too, like what botanicals are they using? And then working those into bases is a really fun, fun way to get some inspiration. And I would also suggest that if, um, if there is an Asian market or even like, um, like Mexican bodegas, like any kind of international food store resource, Indian spice shops, uh, in your area to check those out and, and see what they're selling. And if you can talk to the, um, the store owners, if there's an ingredient that you're not familiar with, kind of find out what it's used for. Also being careful that you're not picking up things that are meant for topical use and not for ingestion. That's, that's a big one. Uh, safety first. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, yeah, I've actually, uh, Highly recommend doing the same thing. Just even for uh, just um, a regular cocktail work, um, we went into um, a Persian market um, mm. a couple months ago and had lunch there and talked to the owner. And I mean, there's a whole bunch of ingredients that I've never even seen or heard or can pronounce. <laughs> like a kid, you know, grabbed a bag and filled it. And I'm like, "What's this? What's this? How do you use this? Yeah. How, do you, how do you eat this?" Um, and he was super excited to kind of share kind of his experiences with it. Like, okay, so and d describe his cuisine. Like, he's, I think what he meant, uh, what he mentioned was, um, you know, Persian food is all about layers, and it's all about when ingredients start to hit your palate. Um, mm -hmm. So he was telling me like this ingredient is really subtle, and we use that kind of more as a, a support supporting flavor or aromatic that kind of helps to pull in other ingredients. So mm -hmm. you get a couple of different ideas and. Um, it's just really fascinating to talk to people that are experts in what they do and see how you can take their ideas and, you know, it, it put that into a flavor or a cocktail form uh, yeah. and without, a, without diluting it too much. Um, so, um, no, that's really great. And, uh, you know, the pastry cookbooks, um, I absolutely agree with you. Like, if you can step into the mind of a pastry chef for a month or a week or a day, Mm -hmm. um, you know, they are absolute masters of extraction, flavor, and um, how, to, how to present things and, and stuff. And I highly recommend, you know, just sitting down and buying a drink for a pastry chef and just picking their brain if they let yes. you. <laughs> that is a great idea. <laughs> yeah, you're going you're gonna to come away with a lot of knowledge and hopefully, you know, somebody you can um, have a drink with and kind yeah. of chat, you know, chat with. Um, so I know you've got a lot going on. Um, is there anything you want to kind of promote or anything that you're working on um, next that uh, you'd love to tell people about? Yes, well, I'm very excited about opening my own bar uh, named Kumiko. So I've been involved with a number of openings, but this is the first time that I'll be a partner in a project. Congratulations. Thank you. And we are hoping for a fall opening. We are saying construction has been, it's a very old building, which I adore. And so we're working on preserving certain elements of it, but we're also finding areas that need a lot of repair. And so we our opening has been pushed back quite a bit, but we're really pushing forward to be open. I'm seeing before the first snowfall in Chicago. So we'll That's see nice. how that goes. Um, Kumiko is a woodworking technique. It's also a woman's name. Um, mm -hmm. I love Japanese because depending on context, words will have completely different meanings, which is really fun. But um, a literal translation of kumiko or like kumitateru is to put together, to build together. And it's a woodworking technique where they will cut tiny like little pieces of wood that fit together from those gorgeous patterns that are inspired by nature and carry some very significant meaning. And so it's an, it's an homage to the process to the, the journey to get to, you know, where we want to be or where we are and how each little minuscule detail matters so much. So, um, yeah, it's going to, a little bit about the name. Mm -hmm. Very and, symbolic, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so you said it's going to be in Chicago, correct? Yes, Chicago in an area that's technically called River West, 
-hmm. but it's basically in the West Loop, which people kind of know a little bit uh, better, I think. And we will certainly be serving Spirit Freeze there. Um, but there's, there's also going to be a very strong focus on Japanese ingredients, so just mm -hmm. things from, from my home country. I would love to introduce people to sake a little bit more and shochu. Mm -hmm. and really dive into some of the weirder things like aomori um, and, of course, Japanese whiskeys as well. But an exploration into things that are coming from Japan, but here in Chicago. And my partners are absolutely incredible. Uh, Noah and Kara Sandoval from Oriel. And so really excited to, to serve some delicious food alongside the drinks. Too. Uh, that's awesome. We'll definitely uh, keep that on our radar. I'm sure it'll make some noise for yeah. sure. <laughs> I, I got to say, man, uh, when we went to Chicago, we love that town. That was like yeah. one of those towns where you're like, I didn't know much about it, um, but when we were there, I think we were there for about a week, um, absolutely fell in love with it. Um, oh, like that's wonderful. Fourth of July weekend, so the fireworks and then sure. aviary and then all the great food and um, all the great drinks in that city is just, it, I could move there in a heartbeat and be so happy. It's good. It's a good city. It really is. Yeah. The winters are, are tough, but I think they bring us together, make us stronger. And the summers are just that much more magnificent as a result. <laughs> oh, everybody was out. It was incredible. Yeah. It's such an uh, active community. And, uh, you know, there's so many great outdoor resources in Chicago that I didn't even realize. You know, all the parks around there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you have um, the Bay or the, um, the Lake Michigan, I guess it is? Or mm -hmm. Yeah, right there. And people were out swimming. I was like, holy crap, this is amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, definitely uh, one of my favorite cities, uh, for sure. Um, and is there any, um, like if somebody had questions or if they want to reach out to you, um, do you have a favorite social media platform that you use or um, anything like that? Yeah, I'm on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And it's momose underscore Julia. And I have that link to Twitter. But I don't really use Twitter. Mm -hmm. I do have a website, uh, www.momosejulia.com. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to be better about updating it. But I have some um, past projects and drinks that I had made posted. And there's a, a contact link there as well. Okay. And Kubiko has its own Instagram account as well. And I've been posting just kind of the journey of getting the bar open. And so if people would like to follow along, they can do so at Bar Kumiko. And how do you spell that? It's K-U-M-I-K-O. Mm -hmm. Perfect, great. And I'll uh, include all those links in the show notes um, so that if anybody um, is interested, they can go ahead and go to the show notes uh, awesome. and uh, find all the, uh, the contact information and the handles and everything. Um, other than that, um, I can't thank you enough for all the time uh, that you spent with us. And, um, you know, if you had any piece of advice for a bartender out there or an enthusiast um, about spirit free cocktails, uh, what would you say to them? I would say don't discount them just because there isn't alcohol in them. And I would say don't let um, cocktails limit your creativity in the spirit free realm. You can go above and beyond all the classic cocktails and modern classic cocktails that are out there. I think the chance to make a mark with Spirit Free is, is very open and, and possible. And so just to have some fun with it. Perfect. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you again. And uh, uh, definitely appreciate all your time. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks again to Julia Mimose for sharing her experience, and I hope a few of you are inspired to try your hand at creating spirit-free cocktails at your bar or restaurant or even at your house. Um, we'll have the links in the show notes over at mixologytalk.com slash 137. And if you're in Chicago or traveling through the area, you should definitely check out her bar that's opening this fall of 2018, uh, Bar Kumiko. Now, if you're enjoying this podcast, we'd love for you to leave a review for us on iTunes. It'll definitely help us reach more people. And uh, 
it would definitely make our day as well. Uh, we, we love hearing the reviews and the feedback. So um, jump on over to iTunes and leave a review. Uh, we'll have more podcasts for you in the future. But until then, have a great shift and cheers. <laughs>